Well, EJ, over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about all the really bad teams in the NFL and how to fix them. We've talked about all the really good teams in the NFL that are currently slated to be playoff contenders and uh, what might trip them up. What we have not talked about at all is the entire wide middle pack of the NFL. Everybody who is, uh, for lack of a better word, stuck in purgatory right now. And uh, there are some teams since we've done, uh, you know, the the basement episode that have moved into the basement. Shout out Washington. And there are some teams that have moved out of the basement. Shout out Atlanta, technically, who went from the ninth pick to the 19th pick in literally one week just by winning one game. Uh, But for a lot of other teams, they've kind of hovered around the middle of the NFL for a long time. You know, plus minus a few games uh, from being 500. You know, they're not in the Caleb or May sweepstakes, but they're also not probably going to make the playoffs. And so what do you do? What do you do if you're stuck in the middle of the league and you're trying desperately to get out of purgatory? We're going to talk about all of those teams today. There's 14 of them, technically 12 of them. And then we're going to talk about the two other basement teams, uh, Chicago and and the Panthers, who we didn't talk about the last time we did this, that are kind of in their own separate version of purgatory for one reason or another. And uh, they've had some interesting developments take place over the last week or so. Before we get into all these individual teams, though, one by one, EJ, how you feeling? You're in luck. I have experience with teams that are locked in the middle. They continually <laughs> go right about 500, always end up kicking their draft pick just out of the top 10, 15, 17, and just do it year after year after year, and then do something stupid to try and get out of that little rut and make it worse. So I can uh, I can offer a lot of expertise here. I have a nice... Nkasi Winter Ale, which is what they have rebranded Slayer for this year. So I am prepared for this discussion. Uh, I, I am still in my Calvados mood, so I still have that neat tonight. Not to not to poke the bear and make things worse. I mean, actually, it is. I'm just being an asshole here. Uh, but the reality of a lot of a lot of teams that are in the middle, i.e., the Bears, for many years, is that again they're not quite good enough to make the playoffs. But they're also not quite good enough to get like the transformational talents, right? Being one pick away from Leonard Williams, being one pick away from Aaron Donald, you know, like year after year after year. Like it's it's hard to get out of that spot because you feel like you can't get like the very, very top prospects uh, and you feel like you almost have to spend your way out of it or just get incredibly lucky, right? And, and hope that somebody falls. It's a tough spot to be in. There's a there's a reason why a lot of teams stay in that spot year after year because it's, it's almost like quicksand. Like once you're in it, it's tough to get out of it. There is a team that that has been in that area for a while, which is going to be our first team, Washington Commanders. And you know, the, even by their standards, which has been generally like a mid pack team, this is a rough year for them. They're currently slated with the fifth overall pick. They don't feel like one of the five worst teams in the NFL, but they have a top five pick. And so they kind of have a unique opportunity that many purgatory teams don't usually get, which is having the ability to get an elite talent that could potentially push a roster that is not in the bottom five of the NFL back into being a playoff type team. Now, what they do with this top five pick is going to hinge a lot of what you feel about Sam Howell. You know, on this podcast, you and I happen to like Sam Howell quite a bit. They also have the third most cap space going into this offseason. They could potentially have $100-plus plus million after all the restructures and cuts and everything like that. And so it's they're kind of in, a, in an interesting position where they have all the money in the world. They're going to have super high draft picks, probably. And the world is their oyster. Like, they're, I have to imagine there's going to be a new coaching regime. You got a new owner in there who's not afraid to spend. So uh, I'm going to give the floor to you first, EJ, when it comes to the Washington Commanders. How do they attack this offseason to get out of this purgatory position? As you said, they're pretty lucky. They have a quarterback who can play. Now, whether or not you think Sam Howell is a top quarterback, that's okay. He has shown more than enough sort of moxie and ability 
to keep this team afloat if you want to put talent around him. And they already have a lot of that talent, which separates them from a lot of teams that end up in this position. One of the rare teams we're going to talk about in this entire list, actually in the entire league, that is set for pass catchers, like wide receivers and tight ends. They have multiples in both categories. There are not too many teams that can say that. So if you're set up with a quarterback and you're set up with pass catchers, you've got a decent stable of running backs. Your defense is okay. It's going to need some help. But like you said, they got free agency dollars. So I imagine there's going to be a pretty big spend there in free agency. They could really use a nickel unless they convert three Castro fields on offense. They need to tackle and it's not necessarily because their tackles are awful, but because their tackles are going to be on their way out the door before too long. And you either need a very good young one that can come in and start right away or one you can groom for a year and then have him ready to start when one of your existing tackles moves on. And on defense, they need an edge, strangely enough, after trading away both their high powered edges. They've got some really good interior players, but you need to be able to pressure the quarterback. And right now they've got mid round picks manning those spots that was on purpose to get themselves some more draft capital. They're going to have to spend high draft capital to get an edge rusher, but it's it's one of the weird teams that doesn't have a great record, does have a quarterback, has lots of players on offense, has a pretty good offensive mind. We'll see whether or not EB stays with the team. If there is a coaching change, who knows, maybe they give him his shot at the ring. We'll see, but it is not a bottom of the barrel team talent wise, and they have both free agency money and they're going to have a high draft pick. This is a chance for Washington to kick itself out of the rut. The fact that they traded away Young and Sweat, despite having a lot of money available, like they could have signed them if they wanted to. Again, they had the third most free agency money. I think those trades were indicative of, of they thought their timeline wasn't ready. Like they still feel like they're more than just a couple edge guys away. And it's true. I mean, if you look at the secondary, they can't cover anybody. You know, linebacking core has really struggled. Davis has played better this year, but like they got to figure out a replacement for Cody Barton. He's kind of, and, and it sucks because I like Cody Barton a lot going into this year, but he just has not had a good year. So they're probably going to look look for a replacement for him. I would I would imagine they're going to look for some like mercenary edges just to hold down the fort uh, for the next couple of years. If I was going to attack this off season, knowing that I have a hundred plus million dollars likely. I would probably approach it of buy a defense, draft an offense, just based on where our pick is and how much money we have. So, you know, try to see if I could throw some money at Daniel Hunter. You know, Zedari Smith is going to be a free agent as well. Bring it, bring them in as again, like veteran, not top of market mercenary contracts. Uh, see what Grant Delpit is going to cost if we can pry him away from Cleveland. I would even say uh, Aziz Alshire to to be that kind of aforementioned Cody Barton replacement because he's he's got uh, like a void year type deal in Tennessee, so he's going to be a free agent too, and he's a massive upgrade. Like they have the money to bring in all those guys to at least have a functional defense. I don't I wouldn't use a top five pick on defense, but uh, you know early second round pick either you know go after another corner if we can or because we have so much money. I would also say that making a trade for somebody who isn't going to be able to be extended at their current destination, i.e. like a Greg Newsom or something like that in Cleveland, because they can't afford to retain Ward and Newsom Everybody. and Emerson <laughs> and Delpit. Yeah. Like I would I would I would pry him away as well, you know, throw a pick at Cleveland, say, here's here's a consolation because you don't have a first rounder. Uh we'll pay him what you can't. And then you use your top five pick on, again, we're just assuming that Sam Howell is going to be the guy. That's when you could use a top five pick on like an Olu or, or an alt to be like your tackle of the future because Leno's going to be a free agent after 2024. And then Wiley, like they brought in Wiley, um, who's been up and down to say the least. He's given up 40 pressures so far this year. Granted, not all of them are his fault. Howell was holding the ball for quite a bit, but like even go back to his time in Kansas City, like his best game as a chief was the Super Bowl. It was his last game. <laughs> so it's like, I, I still don't think that Wiley's like a top tier starting tackle anyway. So it, taking the opportunity to get a potential top tier starting tackle in either Fashanu or Alt, and then investing the second in a corner, whether it's through a trade or through the draft, and then spending an ungodly amount on the defense otherwise. When you factor in everything else that they already have, the weapons, um, you know, hopefully they keep EB in some capacity. 
Like, this team could very easily bounce back in 2024. Like, very, very easily they could. Yeah, and quickly, too. That's the thing is most teams, when you're drafting that high, you're looking at first things first. Got to take quarterback. It's going to take a year. You're going to have to put guys around him. Like, it's a it's a year and a half to two-year window. This is not that team. Like, get Howell a little bit more protection. Make sure that defense doesn't get boat raced. Again, having moved on from Del Rio, I think will help there. They're not talentless, but they certainly have not played up to their talent level. So add a bunch of talent, most likely through free agency, maybe sprinkling a draft pick or two. And this team, the only thing that really gives me pause about saying that Washington's going to bounce real hard is they're in the same division with Philadelphia and Dallas. And that's just yeah. a bummer. <laughs> it's tough. Which is funny because like they, even in their current state, they almost beat the Eagles. Like They, they came... Uh, questionable Terry McLaurin call away from from doing it this year and if they won that game who knows if they would have even traded their edges edges away anyway who, who knows if they would have even made the call to blow it up right but they had some very unfortunate losses early in the year that were very preventable and uh you know but like they're not that far off nope they're really not that far off now the Buccaneers second team on this list I would also classify as not that far off like they're not there they're 100 not there <laughs> but do I think that the Buccaneers are like a bad team in the tra- in the traditional sense of, of what a bad football team looks like? No, like they, they have a seventh overall pick, but like they've been a competitive ball club in a, in a lot of games this year. The, the one question, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it to you with this one first, to Baker or not to Baker, you know, because there's a high likelihood that they're going to be staring down the barrel of a decision between do we roll with Baker again and invest in some other position and need on the team with a premium pick? Or if, say, Jaden Daniels is sitting there at seven, do we pull the trigger and get a young, very, very, very exciting uh, quarterback in Jaden Daniels, even if we feel like the supporting cast could still use some work? Um, like, is, is now the time to do it because they don't think that they're going to pick in the top 10 again anytime soon? It's a, it's a fascinating question. I'm not entirely sure if I know the answer to it yet because I still do think that Baker has his moments, mm-hmm. but at the same time, boy, Jaden Daniels is good, man. He's really good. We're going to be having this discussion a lot. There's a couple chats I'm involved in that are now starting to, to come around to you to daylight themselves to Jaden Daniels' game tape. And I I watched him a lot last year because of the talent they had at LSU. And then I watched him, I think I watched about three games in a row, just completely by accident. Um, Usually keep the tape watching to once most of the season is completed, but I just happened to be in front of the TV for three games in a row. And one of them was the weekend I was down to watch uh, Kansas, Texas. And when we came home, that game was on TV and I sat there cooling down from being in DKR and just watched him light up. Old Miss and I was like he looks different like mm-hmm. he's doing things this year that he didn't do last year and so when people start getting into his tape which they're starting to do now there's going to be a lot of people that go oh I had ideas about who Jaden Daniels was and those ideas are going to change and he's going to end up in the top 10 I'm just going to put that stake in the ground right now he is probably not going to last past the top 10 and it's not what you think about him now it's the three months from now as the process has rolled along Jaden Daniels will go in the top 10 I believe Brugler even put it in his first mock he's like this is the starting point guys <laughs> like it's not going down from here that lit the fuse for a lot of people they were like yeah. what Jaden Daniels in the top 10 I was like yeah, get on the train it's picking up speed so the question about the Bucks with Baker is not not to Baker but not to Baker for the long term And that's almost an ideal position. You can have Baker for another year. He can keep your ball club competitive. He makes it so you do not have to start a rookie right away. And that's a good thing because this team rallies around him. The veterans like him. They understand they have a chance with him. That's an ideal bridge candidate. And there's a lot of teams that do not have that. You are cold turkey with a rookie and you're just telling everybody, look, Just deal with the mistakes. We got to get this guy good so that we can win later on. If you've got Baker in the fold, you don't necessarily have to do that. So you could still pick a guy like Jaden Daniels, not have him start right away, which is still ideal, and then have a succession plan because this is not a talentless roster at all. They've got a good receiving core. The offensive line needs some help. So if you do not 
go quarterback up high, you you got to get some offensive line help in. And there's a lot of folks that will say, hey, they just spent picks on offensive line. There's a thing, right? If they don't bite when they're puppies, sticking with it for two or three more years, unless something seismic happens, a system change, you know, they just weren't being used to their strengths. Like I like a bunch of the players they took, but they have not looked good this year. And it is learning a new offense. I understand that. Everything else, you're going to need some support for Baker or anybody else who's back there because the offense on the line has been beat up and even the players that have been in there have not been great. So if you don't go quarterback up high, go offensive line up high. If you do go quarterback up high, probably still use your next pick on offensive line to bolster that interior, get some options and make sure who's ever in there doesn't get crushed because you've got some good young pieces on defense. Like, you know, Kalaja Kansi looks like the real deal, which is cool. Mm -hmm. They've got some pieces that might age out, but again, they have talent on both sides of the ball. This is not a bottom five roster by any stretch. Got to solve the quarterback position. I think they're actually in a decent position to do that get some offensive line help and they could bounce back and win their division next year. Pretty handily. I think the break glass in case of emergency pick and the emergency is Jaden's gone at six, the giants and you know, Olu and alt are gone. Like if the first five picks are three quarterbacks, Marvin and Olu and you know, they're debating between alt and say Latu Latu. Like that, those are the break glass in case of emergency picks, right? Like, like they're gonna get a good player no matter what. Mm -hmm. But I do think that if Marvin and the three quarterbacks and insert offensive tackle here are gone, it's possible they just say screw it, we're gonna we're gonna shotgun this thing and they move down. Like I I think they are a prime trade down candidate because. I mean, he got worse at left tackle, and then Gadecki. Like, I, I think Gadecki's. So he's, he's okay. He's okay. I, I think as a prospect, I thought he was okay. His his year has been rough. In doing research for this episode, I went in and and looked at a a bunch. I will not say all because I did not, I did not subject myself to all of his pressures, but uh, he's. He's had a rough year. So again, if you believe he's going to take a sophomore jump, cool. But he's he's not somebody that would keep me from picking anybody that I really wanted in that spot right now. So let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Again, they're at seven. Say, yep. out of the first six picks, Jaden's gone to the Giants mm -hmm. at six. Then you got the two other quarterbacks. You got Marvin and then either, either Fashanu or Alt, right, is the other one. Would you take whatever king's ransom is going to be offered to you for the next tackle which is again either alter or fashanu mm -hmm. or do you just take the tackle like do you do you have enough faith in tackles three through five plus picks or do you just say screw it we're gonna we're gonna go with one of the top two I think picks are always good, but if it's Alt sitting there specifically because they moved Wurfs over to left, if Wurfs was still at right, I'd say probably take the picks because I actually think Alt is a better run blocker than a pass blocker right now, although he is also a player that has improved a lot this year, and we'll be talking about him a lot throughout draft season. But he would slot in very nicely at right. And unless somebody gave me a bunch of picks and they might not be willing to they might be willing to give me some but say i'm comfortable with tackle three if i don't get this guy or tackle four depending on where my you know draft spot is if somebody really falls in love with joel and they they think he's an all pro and they're gonna you know they're gonna hand me a bunch of picks i'll probably take it because again i think you can get some help not that much farther on down and be okay but Alt in particular, if it's if Alt's the guy and he's there and the offer's kind of lukewarm to come up and get him, I'd be just fine with them taking Alt, plugging him in at right tackle. Or even, again, if you believe in Gadecki, great, a competition, right? Put him in camp, you're not going to lose. You're going to have a great backup swing tackle. That's not a bad position to be in. And it does line up with their needs. It lines up with where the player fits in terms of his skills. It's going to help their running game right off, which has been not great this year. Um, I don't know any offensive coordinators that don't like having 
a decent solid base for their running game. So it's it's a step up in a lot of directions. If the offer blows you away, sure, go for tackle three or four. Like, have at it. But if not, and you really like Joel, you like the player, you like the makeup, I think the fit is very good, pull the trigger. Well, that's a good segue to our next team on the list, the Jets, who are one pick behind them at the eighth overall pick as of this moment. Um, I have to imagine, like, even though Rodgers started practicing today, like, the fact that they're all but out of the playoff, hunt, it's like a 1% chance to make the playoffs. Like, I don't think Rodgers come back this year just because, it's like, even if he could, like, even if he could, which I'm still not 100% sure if he can, but even if he could, he's not going to do it when they're out of the playoffs. So, cool, he's already practicing. That means that, like, he's going to be okay for next year. That's great. Uh, but, like, this this is going to be a team that probably finishes finishes with a top 10 pick. And as of right now, they're at eight. They're right behind the Bucks. So, if the draft were to happen today... And I'm staring down the barrel of not getting either one of these top two tackles. That absolutely terrifies me because I am going into 2024 with a 40 year old quarterback coming off an Achilles tear with one of the worst pass protection units of the entire NFL. Given that scenario, I am going to send an offer that blows away Tampa because I got to get one of these dudes. Like, I don't even care. Like, Okay, we're moving up one spot. You want our one and you want like a two and next year's three? Fine. You can have it. But like, I I got to get one. Like, I don't think there's another option. Like, their, their window is next year. Got to do it. I agree that they have to get one. I don't necessarily agree that they have to send a King's Ransom. I feel like the absolute 100% lockdown move, if one of the top tackles does not fall to them, is not to trade away a whole bunch of picks. But go wide receiver because this wide receiver class is loaded. I know you're tired of hearing us say that. Trust me on this. It is. This is a stacked wide receiver class. And they have a huge need after Garrett Wilson, who is awesome, and we love Garrett Wilson. This team is rolling out Brownlee, Gibson, and whatever a Charles Irwin is. (laughs) Right? That is not okay, right? You're an injury away from, you know, Gibson being your number two. Like, again, this is the Rodgers parade of retread teammates that they allowed him to sign. Oh, it turns out, guess what? They're not good. It was a healthy scratch last week. Like, you got to get those guys out of the system. He's your quarterback, not your GM. And you need to give him more targets. Like, this was his complaint in Green Bay. Like, draft me wide receivers. Get me targets. And they wouldn't, famously, for years and years. They The Jets can't fall into that trap. They've got to look and say, look, we've got Wilson. We've got a historic wide receiver class. If we get pipped on the tackles, we'll get a tackle later on. We're confident we can do that. We're going to grab one of these headline wide receivers and have two guys that we can roll out, two young, powerful wide receivers that we can roll out so that Aaron's got guys that can separate because if we get guys that can separate, he can hit them. So let's just say Marvin's got, I mean, not even, let's just say, like Marvin's got. He's he's got. Right, he's got. At the eighth overall pick, though, it's possible that they still get their pick of everybody else, right? So it's Neighbors versus Adunze versus Keon Coleman versus... I mean, I, again, you name them, there's going to be like seven guys taken in the first round. Like, th- if there's any class that's going to tie the record for seven first round wide receivers, it's going to be this one. Mm-hmm. Now, the other, the other LSU kid, uh, Brian Johnson, could go in the first round too. So at, at that point, it becomes uh, a who do you want? And so I'll ask you, EJ, who do you want? Who's your wide receiver too? Uh, I don't have a wide receiver two right now, but if you give me a choice between neighbors and Romo Dunze, like, I don't care. Like the answer is yes. Pair either one of those guys. Doesn't matter. That's I mean, it's not that it doesn't matter. They're two different styles, but they're both really good players. I think some people right now would probably blanch at taking a Dunze in the top 10, like eight. I think more people would be comfortable with neighbors because again, oh, somebody threw him the ball. That's a weird thing about neighbors. Anyways, <laughs> like he's more explosive in terms of, you know, flash, but you've got that in Wilson already. Like that's Wilson's game is is, you know, deep speed flash, you know, chunk play explosion. And Odunze is just really good everywhere else. And he's really, really good. So might be a little bit early. 
but you need wide receiver help. You cannot roll that wide receiver, you know, core out again. The Corey Davis retirement and then the Elijah Moore trade. At the time, it was like, well, sure, they've got like 11 receivers. Who cares? Well, turns out three of those guys, you know, are basically retreads and can't play. The other guys are young guys. Nothing against Brownlee and Gibson. Like, they're young players. They could develop into very nice threes and fours. That's fine. But let's not, you know, have have him work his way all the way back from this Achilles tear, roll out Garrett Wilson and Garrett Wilson tweaks a knee and he's out for a month. And you're like, Oh, why did we do this? Like, let's not do that again. I misspoke. It's Brian Thomas, not Brian Johnson. Although there have been multiple Brian Johnson's that played at LSU. Well, no, Brian Thomas, Brian Johnson's the OC for Philly, right? It it came out of my mouth and I was like, wait a minute. No, that's wrong. Brian. (laughs) I was like, there's no way no, there's gotta be Thomson's Johnson's (laughs) Smith's like, they do but he's together. he's the the six four uh absolute lightning bolt that all, like runs four three and uh you know super aggressive as a run blocker a lot of people are convinced that he's going to be a top 32 pick as well but i agree uh, whether it's neighbors whether it's rome can't really go wrong there like if they can't make a deal for a tackle like you're still going to get a good player at that spot you're absolutely going to get a good player and hell, they could even go Bowers. Like, why not? Like, just get get something. Like, get anything on the offense. That's all they need. Uh, next pick, Chargers are at ninth overall. Definitely didn't go into this year thinking that they were going to be a top 10 selection, and yet here we are. Uh, pretty much everything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong for the Chargers this year. The defense has been shaky at best. Well, recently it's played better, but still, on the whole, shaky at best. They need corners. They need interior defensive line. Might need another receiver again. Like, I, there's a lot. There's a lot going on here, EJ. Unfortunately, a lot going on here. They are in a spot where they can kind of go in any direction they want to. I guess my opening question to you is, let's just say the Jets take either neighbor, Neighbors or Adunze there. Is the other one, the leftover one, your top choice for the Chargers? I don't know about top choice because, as you mentioned, they are, they're not a player away. They're not even a side of the ball away. They have needs on both. They have multiple needs on both sides of the ball, which allows them in a draft like this to play the strength of the board. So... If somebody slips that wasn't expected to slip, they can probably use them. Do they need a tackle? No, they don't. But And, and obviously, they don't need a quarterback. But everywhere else, you could take Bowers if you think he's worth that pick. You could take the leftover wide receiver that you're talking about. You could take you know, an edge threat because Bosa continually seems to be injured. Khalil Mack's not going to play forever. We like Thule. But, you know, go get the top pass rushing interior defensive line. It might be a little bit early for that. Get get your favorite corner. We haven't talked about one corner going off the board yet. If they're picking, you know, if they have pick of the litter for corner in this draft, like, mm, they should probably do that. So they can just play the strength of the board based on what falls ahead of them. They're in a prime spot again with all those needs to be able to trade down and still fill multiple needs, which I think they need to do. Our buddy Ben Solak wrote a piece about the Chargers needing to reset. We've been talking about that from a sort of coaching and culture standpoint, but the more you dig into this roster, the sort of thinner it is in terms of age, contract, needing to pay guys, Justin's salary is going to start to hike up here. You're going to have a lot less flexibility and you're going to need to draft better. In my book, that means more bites at the apple. Telesco is going to need to give himself more swing. So if somebody has a player they want, unless you are in love and maybe even if you are, say, I'll take the picks because I need to hit on a bunch of picks. I cannot be poor. My cupboard is not that full. I do think that they're a prime trade down candidate because somebody's going to want to come up for either neighbors or Odunze or Bowers or, you know, hell, like Latu, if Latu's still there, like somebody might go up to get him. Um, Chop Robinson, I know, has a lot of fans. Like somebody's going to want to go up to get one of these guys, one of these blue chippers, right? So the Chargers could move down, especially because, uh, like you said, they don't need a left tackle. 
Right tackle, like Trey Pipkins has unfortunately regressed this year. He's given up nine sacks, 41 pressures. So, like, left tackle's totally fine. Right tackle, you you could probably use competition there. Do you need to spend a first-round pick on it? You'd have to really, really love Fuaga to 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 take him over what they really, really need. Um <laughs> You know, whether it's Wiggins from Clemson or like Johnny Newton, like you said, is is kind of like the dark horse for the Chargers of giving them another interior guy because it feels like their pass rush really only works when Thule's lined up inside. <laughs> so yeah. it's like giving them something inside so that Thule can play more out on the edge would be great. It's a fascinating team because they can go in any direction, but the fact that they can go in any direction is indicative of just how far away they are. And it feels like 12 months ago, we were super high on the roster and then this season happened and we're like, Oh God, <laughs> like they're actually, they're kind of far away. So like, I, I don't think that this is an immediate fix. And like you said, uh, it, it might take them trading down to get extra ammo to, to get back quickly. And it's going to depend on the coaching situation. It's very possible that Staley moves on if so, you've got a brand new coaching staff. What are they like? What kind of defensive pieces do they prioritize? What do they need to make their systems work? Whatever they're bringing in on both offense and defense, but I would say primarily defense in that case. It's a sort of wait and see to be like, okay, what are they? Are they a pressure based defense? Are they coverage based defense? They run more man, more zone. And that's going to determine how a lot of those picks get spent, whether or not Telesco goes out and grabs them. Next team. Speaking of needing offensive line help, it's kind of a general theme with with lower to middle pack teams of, oh, they need offensive linemen. Uh, the Titans, they need offensive linemen more than most. They are the second highest pressure percentage allowed in the entire NFL. Let's just assume that Will Levis is going to be the guy, at least for a couple years, right? He's shown enough that I think they'll give him a shot. Like, I don't think that they're in the market for Jaden Daniels or Bo Nix or J.J. McCarthy. Like, I think it's, it's you know, Will Levis. All right, let's see what you got. But in order to see what Will Levis has got, Will Levis needs to be upright and, like, alive, right? You pulled a, you pulled a really interesting stat that they're only offensive linemen with a pressure allowed percentage under 5% is Skaronsky. Everybody else is just terrible, right? It's it's bad. So I have to assume they are another one of these teams that is a a possibility of trading way up to get either Fashanu or Alt. If that doesn't happen, what do they do? Well, they need center and tackle. Center and tackle for them have been terrible just between those two players alone. You're talking about 28 pressures allowed. Radins has been awful, like 11 and a half pressure percentage allowed. For reference, like two to four is pretty good. Below two is exemplary. Like five, you're allowing a lot of pressures. 11? Like, no. That You're talking about having to have your rookie quarterback or, you know, soon to be first year quarterback upright that's not a recipe for having that occur. So you're going to need some help. You need a center. You need a tackle. It's going to be early to take a center with their first pick. Probably going to be looking for a tackle. And, you know, but they need both. They can't sort of slack off and go, oh, we got one. We're fine. So whether they do that in free agency, whether they do that in the draft, either way, you cannot go into next year with a wrong young quarterback and expect him to succeed when he's seeing that much pressure because he has one guy he can count on in front of him right now, and that is not enough. They need to play as a unit. When four of them are failing more often than not, Like that's, that's not going to get it done. They also have the most cap space in the NFL as of right now going into the offseason. That's before cuts and restructures and everything like that. They're at $100 million already. So they're like the bizarro Browns, right? <laughs> like they have more money than they know what to do with. So they could theoretically go buy an all, entire offensive line if they want to, bring in a bunch of veterans, bring in a bunch of mercenaries, and then use that 10th overall pick on basically anything else. Go get a pass catcher. Like, please, please, if you get him, him being the quarterback protection go get him some targets because like Traylon Burks is good when he's on the field uh you know we like some of their other complementary pieces but we're not you know is D-Hop gonna be there and 
you know, not falling off his game. Can't guarantee that. Is there anybody else on their roster that makes you go, oh, no, no, we wouldn't we wouldn't draft a top pass catcher. We have blank besides Traylon when he's healthy, which has been a struggle. You need to give Will Levis some targets. Like, even as much as we love Chick, and we're like, we're he's- a pro-Chick podcast. If Brock Bowers is there, and they say, we're going to take Brock Bowers. I say, cool. Like, I, I'm good with it. You know, <laughs> like, that's how good he is. And run a bunch of two tight end sets because now you have two dangerous tight ends like truly dangerous tight ends who are perfect fits in the modern pass catching nfl like these neither one of them is liability in the pass game otherwise they're actually pluses so you know to me that would look very much like grabbing a you know prime pass catching tight end a mark andrews somebody like that that becomes a focal point of your offense it's not a oh we couldn't get a receiver you got a receiver he just happens to be freaking six five or whatever he is and you know 235 pounds crazy a lot of people have concerns about bowers's size at you know 235 240 somewhere around there that general ballpark and i'm like well there's a lot of tight ends that play around there in the Have NFL you now. seen him play would be my answer because, like, you know that you're going to basically have to tranquilize me when we talk about Brock Bowers because <laughs> I've loved Brock Bowers for a couple of years. Like, watching that guy play football has very little to do with his size. Watching his skill as a football player. He's an amazing athlete, but he is also an amazing football player, and that's a different thing entirely. He is an amazing football player. Like, he is a difference maker flat out. Don't care what you call him. He is a great, great player. So when you start talking about a guy and, you know, maybe you don't follow the draft, maybe you're not in college football, and you go, wait, he's a tight end. What are you talking about? Like, just go watch him play, and you'll probably change your mind. That general range of size, I mean, we've seen Jordan Reed make it work. We've seen Evan Ingram make it work. We've seen Chris Cooley make it work. There there have been a lot of tight ends that have played around between 235 and 245. Like you don't you don't need to be 260 to be a tight end in the NFL. Now, if you want to be a Y, sure, fine, be 260. But in terms of what <laughs> like a modern, <laughs> you know, movable chess piece tight end, H backy type guy is, like yeah, fine, 235. This is normal. It's fine. Size is not it. I love it. I love that you just say B two sixty like it's B nice. (laughs) Just B two sixty. Okay. And the answer isn't just oh pack on muscle, because every time you pack on muscle, like you might lose a little bit of fluidity. So it's a it's a delicate balance. That's why every team has a team of nutritionists to keep these guys where they're supposed to be, and it's it's very very hard to do. Anyway, tangent over. (laughs) Next team on the list: Raiders. Next team. They they just took a young tight end, uh, Michael Mayer, who's come on over the last five, six weeks or so and become the player that we all thought he could be. Mm-hmm. You know, it took a while for them to realize, like, oh, we have this young tight end that's actually really talented. Let's get him the ball. And then they finally started getting him the ball. And it's like, oh, he's good. Who knew? I, I think it took Aiden saying, hey, man, he's – I've had some good tight ends. Like, Aiden's tight end got drafted, but, like, this guy's really good. I'm just going to throw him the ball. It feels like that. It feels like he looks for him primarily on a bunch of routes that he was not, Mayor was not getting looks on early in the year. And, you know, you put the ball in his hands and sure enough, he's a big, he can rumble, he can break tackles, he can do all that stuff. And he started doing that stuff. And then people are like, oh, hey, look at that. And Aiden's like, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to keep doing it because it works. It's so rare to see a tight end look like they're going to be an NFL player when they're 18. And that's what Mayor was at Notre Dame. So it's like... <laughs> Duh, like duh, he's good. <laughs> like, how did it take so long? <laughs> we could say a lot of things about the Raiders' previous regime and not recognizing and using talent properly. That's just a highlight case. Yes, icing on the cake. Um, now, best case scenario for the Raiders, and again, we love Aiden O'Connell. Like we are a pro Aiden O'Connell podcast, but we're not delusional. Like Aiden's not the prospect that Jaden Daniels is. So if Jaden Daniels is there, he probably won't be. But let's just say he is. Jaden's probably the pick. It's a 1% chance he is, but he's probably the pick if he is. In the absence of that, it now becomes a question of, 
Are we comfortable with Bo Nix? Are we comfortable with J.J. McCarthy? Do we like them better than Aiden O'Connell with what he's shown so far? And if the answer for that is no, then you open up an entirely new conversation of like, okay, beyond quarterback, what do we need? For me, and I understand like the offense has has a bunch of issues and they've had a bunch of issues this year, but for me, this team, like the cornerstone of this team is Max Crosby. Get Max Crosby some help. They tried to do it last year. Tyree so far, like, love the guy coming out, but nine pressures the entire season is not enough. A pass rush win rate of 4.3% is not enough. That's like a third of average. Like the average pass rush win rate, he's like a third of it. So it's like he just hasn't been good this year. And so I almost treat it of like a treat it as like a, an Alex Leatherwood type situation where it's like, hey, we get to, if we get to the rookie year and they don't look like they belong on the field at all, like we don't need to be married to this. We can take another swing. Like we can go after Lotto if we want to. We can go after Chopper Robinson if we want to. If we want to give Tyree another year and go after interior, we can go with Johnny Newton. But somebody has to help out Max Crosby. Like, Max Crosby's the team. He's the heart and soul of the team. Like, he really is. Him and him and Spillane, honestly, are like the guys on defense that, that get everybody going. And Crosby's arguably the best player on the team overall. Get him some help. I don't believe that they have enough right now. Like, even if Tyree works out, I still don't think they have enough. And I think if they don't get a quarterback... They might as well go D line because the current D line they have right now is just nowhere near where it needs to be. And you've got guys that can help. And like you said, even if Tyree comes along in his second year and, and you know, maybe the foot's been bothering him all year and he's just trying to play through it, that's the kind of stuff that comes out in the offseason. Oh, he was hurt all year. Like, and he comes back healthy and he looks good. That's probably still not enough. That's your indicator that you need to go get one more. Usually you have to pick those guys up high, whether it's Robinson, whether it's a guy like Jared Verse, Latu, whoever it is, like go get some more pass rush to put more pressure on opposing passers. Back to the Aiden question, I think Aiden looks a lot this year like Sam Howell looked at the end of last year. Like, ooh, there's some flashes there. There's a bunch of stuff we don't like, but should we give this guy some more run? And if they say, hey, look, Washington's been able to make it work with Howell. Do we surround him with some more talent and let him ride for another year and put, you know, more pieces on defense? Go get another pass catcher that can separate because, look, if Devontae goes down, you've got two guys that don't separate really well, especially not down the field. And Jacoby Myers and Hunter Renfro. So go get another big, tall, fast wide receiver. Doesn't have to be with their 11th pick can be in the next round because again, it's a very deep class. There's going to be guys there, especially if you're not looking for him to be an alpha, which you don't need right away with Devontae in the fold. Like, But go get some help for the wide receiving core. Go get some more targets if you're going to roll with Aiden. And same thing, I am 100% with you got to support Max Crosby, got to, they have some nice complimentary pieces, but they need more horsepower on that pass rush and they can get it with an 11th overall pick. 12th overall pick team after them, uh, has the former Raiders quarterback who Aiden O'Connell sort of kind of replaced. Uh, not really kind of. like roundabout yeah. kind of way. Yeah. Uh, the Derek Carr contract in new Orleans has not worked out so far. New. like at all uh and unfortunately for them they can't really get out of it until 2025 which is the nature of the deal so like there's still a, another year for him to potentially turn it around maybe you know keyword maybe but i think it would behoove them to maybe have a future option on hand just in case things don't change next year which again brings up the Bo Nix, J.J. McCarthy conversation. I know that you you were advocating for bringing in Jacoby Brissett as maybe competition for Carr. I don't necessarily think they're going to want to invest even more money into quarterback because part of the reason why they structured the Carr contract the way they did was to save money, like in terms of the void years in the back and everything like that. And I think Jacoby Brissett's going to be like a very expensive backup. Like, I think he's going to make a lot of money on the market. So I don't know if they're going to do that. The, the question I would pose to you is, 
does Bo Nix fit there that high or J.J. McCarthy or Michael Penix? And if not, what do they do? Because they're kind of in no man's land, right? Like they are the definition yeah. area of definition of a purgatory team. They got a lot of money. They got to figure out in Mar. I mean, they always do, but like they got to do it again. Yes. You know. Yep. They got a quarterback contract that's not looking good. They have, a they can, they have kind of needs on both sides of the ball. Like they're not bad on either side of the ball. Well, they kind of are, but like not real. Like they're not like <laughs> putrid. You know, they're not like Jets bad. Oh. But they still have needs on defense, too. Like, the one thing that we could hang their hat on for a long time was, hey, our defensive line is going to kick ass and take names. Defensive line hasn't played super well this year. Like, 19th in pressure percentage. So, it's like they, they need they need defensive linemen. They might need a quarterback. You could look on the offensive line. Like, there's a lot going on here. And there's also the quarterback question. So, where do you begin looking at this Saints team? This has a lot to do with whether or not they're going to go for continuity, and they have loved continuity in the coaching staff in New Orleans for a long time. If they are just going to, quote-unquote, try and run it back and sort of hold their hand up to the side of their face and whistle and pretend that you know 30 possessions by your new starting quarterback have not ended in a touchdown, like 30-plus, like that's that's a thing. So yes, there is a chance for Carr to rebound a little bit. Hey, can we have Sean Payton back? He, he did it with Russell Wilson. <laughs> like Russell Wilson had a terrible year, and he actually looks functional this year. Carr is going to be in a very, very similar position. He has a terrible year going this year. I don't see that turning around before the end of the season. He is going to need a serious rebound. And like you said, they're kind of stuck with him. But does that mean you just sort of mail the season and go, well, we can't do anything about it and, you know, alternate Taysom Hill in, throw in some Jameis if he comes back or go get a guy like Jacoby Bissett to ostensibly be the backup. But if he plays better, play him for, you know, yes, expensive, but expensive backup money, not expensive starter money to give yourself a chance, because I don't feel like right now a team that can't score any points has any chance. So how do you sell that, you know, to your players, to your offensive players? Um, If they choose to just sort of put their hands over their eyes and say, it'll work, it'll work, just trust us. And they don't address quarterback because they don't think they can financially. Yeah. I would look to the lines and in particular, they need a tackle. Like Andres Pete is bad. Like he is the weak link in this offensive line. He is not great. Very high pressure percentage, um, you know, getting his quarterbacks hit a lot. He he just has had a very bad year. So, again, if he's struggling with an injury that they know about and they think he'll bounce back, great. But if not, you can't just leave him there and say, oh, we're fine. Go get an offensive tackle. Defensive line would fit organizationally with what they've done under Mickey Loomis. They have spent high draft picks year after year on defensive linemen, interior and exterior. That is where they have gone all those years that they were at the end of the first round. It was like clockwork. Okay, here comes the Saints pick at, you know, 25, 28, 29, whatever it is. Guess what? They're going to pick, you know, high upside defensive linemen to, again, just go with that very deep unit. And that is what they're going to hang their hat on from a defensive perspective. Don't know if that'll continue. Wouldn't be surprised if it did. Those trends do seem to carry over. And again, Mickey Loomis has been the GM there for freaking ever. Um, so he might say, hey, this is what got me here. I'm just going to keep doing that. And if somebody falls to the end of the first round, they always will. I will pick the most talented defensive lineman I can. And that's great. I'll pick up a tackle a little bit later. And we will just kind of close our eyes about the quarterback situation because we don't really think there's anything to do. And then pick up a, you know, possible developmental future successor throw whatever word you want at it in the middle rounds which does not have a very high success rate but if that's going to be their tip of the cap to quote unquote acknowledging the quarterback situation okay (laughs) the one that i would throw out again let's say they go either tackle because like beyond beyond pete like pete's a guard that they moved out right but beyond pete like the other option, left tackle Trevor Penning, hasn't exactly blown you away either, right? So it's like they they kind of need one no matter what. <laughs> like it doesn't really matter who is out there. Like they 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 need they need to be better at that spot. Yes. So even if they even if they don't take a tackle, uh, and they and they go 
say, edge first round, improve that rotation, and they punt on quarterback to late in the draft. The name that I have in mind for somebody who could potentially take over down the line if we're just treating Derek Carr as a bridge, this is surprising even myself considering what I thought of him as a prospect a couple years ago. But there's been tremendous growth, both on and off the field, honestly. And that's Spencer Rattler. Hmm. Like, Spencer Rattler, 2021-ish, you know, when when he lost the job to Caleb, I was like, no way. Like, this is never going to work. Never going to work. A couple years later, a lot of development later, ironically, he just declared today, by the way. Um, But I look at Spencer Rattler now, and I'm like, you know what? There's something there. Like, obviously, the arm talent, the physical talent, but in terms of decision-making, in terms of ball placement, in terms of just, like, maturity as a person, like, he is so far ahead of where he was a couple of years ago. And I think uh, he's a great example of, you know, 19-year-olds aren't fully developed in a lot of ways. Like, let's at least see what he looks like when he can drink. You know, <laughs> yeah. let's see what he looks like when he can get close to running a car. And, you know, you wait a couple of years and, and somebody grows as both a player and as a person. And you're like, oh, okay, there's something there. And I, I think that... Uh, I think that having, having rather him having the patience to stay in school and to to develop and having the discipline to develop uh, is really a credit to him because a couple of years ago he was not a draftable player and now he's somebody who could legitimately go in like the second round. And I, if I was the Saints, I would strongly consider taking him to hopefully be like our Will Levis. You know, Will Levis coming in, playing behind Ryan Tannehill, and then eventually, like, taking over in the middle of the year and becoming the guy. Like, that's that's what I hope for, for Spencer Rattler, is to be that kind of round two, not even lotto ticket, but round two chance. And, and hopefully his physical talent, which is considerable, uh, can translate into him being an option in the future. Like, that's that's kind of how I would approach it for New Orleans. Rattler's going to have a really good chance to show off in the pre-draft process, except it is senior bowl invite. His top wide receiver is also going to the senior bowl. That always helps. Xavier oh, I missed that. Yep. Xavier will get accepted <sighs> his invite today. God, so, he's good. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to have some fun together. They're going to be able to light it up. It's always fun when you have a teammate there, they might not end up on the same team, which means that would be reduced, but that's okay. And I'm with if, you. It, Jim knows what he's doing. He's going to put them on the same team. Yeah, like we we'll we need to see those sixty yard bombs in practice, okay? Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I imagine. Well, I think scouts might be of two minds about that, but we'll see. In terms of Rattler as a player, he sort of peaked a couple of years ago in terms of draftability. Everybody, and it was more preseason hype about, hey, this is going to be the guy. It didn't work out, and that was a real crossroads for him. Because he could have said, screw it, I'll go anyways, it's as close as I'm going to get. I think that would have been very detrimental for his career because of where he was developmentally, both as a player and, you know, just as a human being, like you said, not being of an age yet where you're making your best decisions. Chooses to stay in school, chooses to transfer, chooses to, you know, commit to his craft, continues to work. I think now is arguably at a higher place than he was at that previous spot where everybody said oh hey he's going to be one of the top draftable prospects and then it doesn't work out it's a very hard thing to sort of bounce back from and overcome when everybody's whispering in your ear you know preseason all-american hey you're going to be right up there and then it just doesn't happen to the point where you go oh i'm not even sure i'm going to stay here sort of goes quietly transfers to another school keeps his head down keeps working has a very good season shows progress in a lot of areas that scouts are going to look at 
now has another chance to take what I would say is even a cleaner run at that process. And yeah, I mean, let's be honest, the Saints, you know, one of the greatest quarterbacks in Saints history was drafted in the top of the second round. So, um, you know, not by them, but that's okay. They, they have success with players in that mold. So could I see it? Yes. And not having to play right away, I think is a really important thing, no matter what you think about Carr. I think he can definitely be a, a sort of steadying influence that says, this is how you get to be a pro. And yeah, hopefully Rattler takes the reins by the end of, you know, very end of year one. And then is a guy they can look at going forward to hand the ball to and say, let's see what you got. Two picks later, uh, our next team on this list of purgatory teams, uh, the LA Rams. They're currently sitting at the 14th pick. Now they did win a Super Bowl a couple of years ago. So like they've gotten out of purgatory before they spent their way out of it and they traded their way out of it, but they got out of it by being ultra, ultra, ultra aggressive. <laughs> I'm not necessarily sure that they are still in that mindset, you know, that, that fuck them picks mindset. Like I, they've kind of switched up and now it's give us all the picks yeah. mindset. They had like 14 <laughs> rookies last year. Yep. I, I have to imagine they might look at doing the same thing again this year because that shotgun approach is what allowed them to, get a guy like Puka in the fifth round, mm-hmm. Kobe Turner in the third round, Byron Young, I think was also a third round pick. Like they were able to get a bunch of good young guys because they, they played the volume game, right? Yeah. Sitting at the 14th pick, I kind of feel like they might do it again because Olu and Alt are both going to be gone. You could maybe talk me into Fuaga, Latham or Mims around there too. But in the absence of that, like I can't, I can't really think of another another position that they have to take at fourteen, like that they absolutely have to take because all the quarterbacks are going to be gone, at least all the ones that we think could start fairly quickly are going to be gone, and so it's either you take the tackle early on because their offensive line is an issue, or you trade down, you collect a bunch of picks, and you try to shotgun it again which I think they very easily could do. I can absolutely see them, you know, running the shotgun approach back because it did work for them and it collected them a lot of young talent that's allowing them to build a lot of the growth that is going to benefit them next year, even if it isn't this year. It reminds me a little bit of the Chiefs defense um, in a completely different phase. Last year, the Chiefs defense was really young. They ended up winning a Super Bowl because, again, thanks, Pat. That's cool. This year, that (laughs) Chiefs defense freaking amazing like you saw the flashes last year this year they you know rounded off all the rough edges the the few there were and they have a very good very strong young defense you know based off the players that they got last year the rams are going to have some of that next year all these players who have shown flashes byron young and kobe you mentioned those guys are going to be a year better next year and i could see them again doubling down kind of like what the Seahawks have done. The Seahawks have done a bunch of picks, not necessarily lower picks, but just a bunch of picks two years in a row and really sort of re-energize the organization. Rams are in the middle of that right now. You pose the question about whether or not you get a tackle and whether or not it's too early for that sort of top second tier of tackles. My answer is no. Unless you get one in free agency, you need one. You need one bad. 11th highest pressure percentage allowed. That's largely because of the tackle spots. The center hasn't been great, but the center's pressure percentage allowed is half of both of the tackles. It's under five and both the tackles are over 11. So, uh, you know, Stafford amazes me in his ability to take punishment. He, He did that in Detroit, but all those hits stack up. And at some point, he or his body is just going to say, yeah, I'm done. Check, please. Like, I'm out. And that's going to be a rough spot for them. They don't have a lot behind him right now. But if you have that kind of protection for a beat-up Matt Stafford, like, you're just going to accelerate that timetable. So I think you need at least one tackle up high. And then see what you can do to stack picks on the way down. Because you don't – this is not a team that needs to stick and pick or be – completely sold on their guy they showed a hardcore pivot less need showed a hardcore pivot to yeah i could take i could trade down take all those picks and be completely happy getting 14 15 17 rookies in the door and having them contribute because that's where we're at in terms of our just call it what it is rebuild 
as we sort of recover from our Super Bowl hangover. Um, and it's been effective. They're on track. I, it's hard to see. I know Rams fans, they're getting the, you know, they're getting their teeth kicked in a lot, but they're much more competitive than many people thought they were going to be this season. And that's going to be even better next season. So I can see the double down working for them. For Rams fans that are sad right now, I want you to look at the Packers, who this time last year, like again, very young team that is now, I mean, it took until basically Thanksgiving of year two for them to figure their shit out, you know? But they're starting to figure it out, and they're starting to look good. The Rams had even more youth this year. They had 36 rookies on the roster going into training camp. Like, 36. That's insane. Okay? Yep. So, like, it, there was no way that it was going to click that early. Like, now, they, they were competitive, and they have been competitive this year in a lot of games. But they're so young, and it's it's a bunch of older stars and a bunch of kids. It's Stafford and Cup and AD and a bunch of kids. So it's like, yeah, like there's going to be growing pains, and there's still going to be growing pains. But once this group just gets a little bit older and a little bit more experienced, A, you know, they're all going to be dirt cheap because it's a bunch of like third through fifth rounders. Uh, but B, like they're going to be deep. Like, this Rams team was not deep. That's why they fell off a cliff after the Super Bowl. They had no depth. Now, they're building a sustainable foundation with depth and with volume. And it's very much, you know what it reminds me of? Early Pete and Schneider years in Seattle, Mm -hmm. where it was come one, come all. Like, they were the Ellis Island of the NFL. Like, more transactions than anybody else, more rookies than anybody else, UDFAs, late-round picks. Like, they didn't care. They were like, we're going to get a bunch of dudes. They took that approach last year. I think they could do it again this year. And that approach is what allowed Seattle to have sustainable success for a really, really long time. And they kind of got back to it again in the last couple of years. And they're, they're building another kind of rock on which to build their castle right now. And, uh, you know, I think the smart teams are the ones that do that. Yeah, it'll be interesting Again, both those teams being in the same division, it's always interesting when you see mirrored approaches within the same four team division and that's going to play out. We're going to see who's right. You know, those teams uh, are I don't want to say rivals because it really feels like the Niners or the the Seahawks rival within the division. But man, the Rams have had their number. McVay's won more games against Pete than anybody else. So they're, you know, the rival B, I guess, is the way that works. And we're just going to see which they're more so just the. They're the thorn nemesis. in the side. It's, there's yep. rival and then there's nemesis. And I think there's yes, two different. Nemesis <laughs> is perfect for the Rams in terms of the Seahawks. So we'll see who's whose approach uh, in terms of the general manager and the coaching staff, you know, works down the line longer term. Uh, 15th pick, one pick after the Rams, uh, the team that played them in the Super Bowl, Cincinnati Bengals. Full disclosure, Bengals are not supposed to be here. Like this is this is not a normal purgatory team. Like they're not really in purgatory. Okay, we're being honest. Like they're not going to be here next year. Well, if Joe stays healthy, they're not going to be here <laughs> next year. But the only reason they're here is because Joe was hurt the first month of the season. Then they went on a run, and then Joe got hurt again. Like that is literally it. That is the reason why they have the fifteenth overall pick, and why they're not in contention for the first seed. Can you bank on that happening again in twenty twenty four? Probably not. So, at least we hope so. Knock on wood. This isn't real wood, but still, knock on this whatever is. you got near you. <laughs> so, you know, I again, this is kind of a, this is not a normal circumstance. But yeah. it is a circumstance that Cincinnati can take advantage of. You know, they have a bunch of money going into this off season, but I also think that bunch of money is kind of earmarked for <laughs> the obvious extension to Jamar Chase. And then I think they should bring back DJ reader again. Um, I think they should bring back a Like uh, I think they should bring back. Yeah. You know, well, I don't know. Tyler Boyd's probably not going to be too expensive. Like I can't imagine he's going to be like a, a bank breaking deal for your slot or your number three. But what I don't think that money is earmarked for is T Higgins because T Higgins is going to command a top of market deal. Whether or not you think it's worth it, that's up to you to decide. For me, considering the receiver class that this is, 
I wouldn't do it. Like, for me, I wouldn't do it. And I even advocated for them trading him for a first-round pick last offseason because that was the most value they were going to get for him was a first-round pick. And if he walked in free agency, like, they'll get a they'll get a compensatory third. But right now, if they're going to trade him, the most they're going to get is a two. You're not just trading for the player. You're trading for the opportunity to pay the player. And so a team's not going to trade a first-round pick that they're also going to have to pay for a guy who has had durability concerns. Like, it's going to be a two, right? So for me, I take all the cap space that they have. I pay Jamar. I pay some of the other core key pieces that aren't going to cost $30 million a year, like Jamar will. I trade T for a high second round pick, cough, cough, Panthers. And then <laughs> I use the 15th pick or the 33rd pick. Let's just say it's Carolina. And I get a T Higgins replacement, a new wide receiver two or rather wide receiver one B, if we're being honest about it. Or this is another option. Or <laughs> this is the fun option. This is the one that I oh, want Bengals fans okay. to consider. So you trade T, you get 33 from the Panthers. They pay him like 20 whatever million a year. You don't have to deal with it. You get the pick. You got 15, you got 33, and you got your two. What do you say about making an all LSU offense once again? We take <laughs> those picks, we package them, we go up, and we give Joe Burrow Malik Neighbors to go along with Jamar Chase. How about that? It would be very sexy. There's no doubt about it. And again, the only reason we're talking about this team is because their all-world starting quarterback was hurt to start the year and then got hurt in the middle of the year. And if you think it would be any different for any of the others, if you think the Chiefs would just be rolling off wins if Pat was sidelined or the Bills oh, God, if Josh no. Allen was sidelined, like <laughs> – it just doesn't happen. You cannot pay two starting quarterbacks, and you certainly cannot pay two superstar starting quarterbacks. So if any of those players went down, all of their teams would suffer a similar fate. They would probably be on this list, and we'd be talking about them too. That being the case, it's funny. The T situation last year was, no, no, they got money to pay everybody, and a bunch of us went, no, they don't. Like, not in two years they don't. Like, yeah, they can run it back one more year, which is what they're trying to do. And it's admirable. I understand that. Like, hey, Joe's healthy. Let's make another run right now. We're loaded up. Keep him. You know, we're dropping a couple of rounds of draft value from a possible first last year to a third compensatory. Or maybe we split the difference and we get a two out of him this year, depending. I don't know that they will because of the salary. I mean, you've got to pay him and wide receivers are more and more expensive all the time. And it will be a top of market deal. Make no mistake. His agent isn't going to let that slide. So the real thing is if you trade T and you don't re-sign Tyler Boyd, pass catchers are going to be your premium. Then you're looking at Jamar Chase and Charlie Jones, which I like Charlie, but Charlie's a good like three. I like Charlie a lot too. Need another one. <laughs> but two. you need another one. <laughs> And so that's a, you know, we go get a tight end because, again, we really had high hopes for Irv Smith. That really hasn't worked out. You go get a Brock Bowers. And again, he slots in as another top tier pass catching threat regardless of position designation. And that's fine. But you probably still need another one if you let both those guys walk. So I'm saying if you sign Tyler Boyd and he sort of slots in and becomes your auto number two, Jones is your three. You still probably go get a guy like Brock Bowers. And then you got Chase and Boyd, and Bowers, and Charlie. And okay, now we're fine because Joe will spread it around. He needs multiple targets. So it's really a question of which of those two do you let go? If it's both, you got to fill those holes in some way. And, you know, then maybe do Tobin and his guys trade down. But I don't really see them as a trade down candidate. They are a team that, again, if Joe is back and Joe is healthy, you give him his targets, you let him go on his run, and Rumo's, you know, assuming he doesn't get a head coaching shot, is going to make the defense work. Do they need help there? They do. They could use some more defensive line pressure, too. They started off pretty good. Then they suffered, you know, getting nicked up and their pressure percentage dropped. They're kind of a sneaky Johnny Newton team, in my opinion. I, sure. I could see it. Like, pass rushing from the interior be great. It's very much like the pass catching, you know conversation it doesn't matter where it comes from you got to have hands that can catch those so you got to have pass rush i don't care if it comes from a slashing three tech or a true outside edge or even a you know sort of lobo backer runner on the outside if you get some you know 230 pound demon that you know you can bring on a blitz great cool 
So lots of different options for them. But look, if Joe's healthy, this team's going to be in it next year. And if Joe's not healthy, they're not. And that's really no different than any other team with a superstar quarterback that gets hurt. For Bengals fans that are yelling right now for offensive line help, you're correct. They need offensive line help, but they need interior help. You're not going to spend the 15th overall pick on a guard in this class, at least none of the guards that are available in this class, right? So that's a day two thing. And day two's always been kind of like the sweet spot for interior offensive linemen anyway. So like, don't worry. Like that's part of the equation, but we're not talking about like top 15 part of the equation. If anything, it's, again, you're using the 15th on either receiver or Newton or whatever, something that can get pressure. And then you come back and I don't know if Barton will be there. Well, I don't know. Maybe with the 33rd pick if they trade T. Like Barton, I could see at 33. But, or the, who's the Washington kid, by the way? Uh, I can't, Fatanu. God, he's good. He's real good. He, he's so good. But again, that's another like day two guy, you know? And again, if the Bengals hadn't done what they did, which was finally address the offensive line last year and say, no, give us the pieces. Like we're going to trade for some, we're going to draft some. Like we're going to get pieces in front of Joe because Joe kept getting absolutely annihilated. Like, and then, you know, who knows this year is Risco's pop, not because he got annihilated, but it just happened. But if they hadn't taken that approach, we would be trumpeting like you need offensive line, kind of like we were with the Titans, right? But they did. They stepped up. They paid a bunch of money in free agency. Yeah, you need another one, but you can get him second, late second, early third from then on yeah. down. You'll be okay. Uh, the Bills are one pick after Cincinnati. Kind of amazing uh, how these are two, <laughs> at least before the year, we're like, hey, these are two AFC superpowers. They're going to be going at it, you know, division round. And now they're sitting here in the 15th and 16th overall pick right now. The Bills, for an entirely different reason than the Bengals, Josh Allen has stayed healthy, and Josh Allen has been productive this year. Bunch of touchdowns. Also a lot of turnovers. And, you know, we've talked extensively about what the issues with the offense were. I did a whole film room episode on it as well in terms of their inefficiency on a per-drive basis at getting into scoring position. Uh, Things got better, you know, when they made a change at OC, for sure. I, you know, potential too little too late type thing you know because they were already in kind of a deep hole and they're just getting into the hardest part of their schedule you know you still got games against dallas they just lost against philly like it's it's not a cakewalk the rest of the year so they're probably done like they're not a hundred percent done but they're probably done they have like a 14 percent chance of making the playoffs and again it's not because their quarterback got hurt i just think they took too long to make adjustments to address what was going wrong, which ultimately comes down to Sean McDermott, which means the Bills might be making this pick with a new head coach going into this year. Now, I'm not ready to advocate for Sean McDermott getting fired. I don't, I don't ever really want to advocate for somebody getting fired. Like That seems like a shitty thing to advocate for. But it seemed like going into this year, that was, uh, that was an unconscionable thought. And four months later, I'm like, well, what could happen? Because ultimately, how slow they were to make the necessary changes on offense does kind of come down to him and and his his reluctancy to do that. So, you know, whether or not McDermott's going to be making this pick, I don't know. I would understand if he's not. And if they bring in a new head coach, cough, cough, Ben Johnson, you know, that would that would potentially change the entire outlook for what this pick is going to be. But in the meantime, let's just say it is Sean McDermott. And they are sitting there at 16. Where do you think they would look to first? Because it's probably not where I think they would look to first. Yeah, I think this is a team that has, with the addition of Dalton Kincaid, has enough targets right now. They... This is not a team that is shorting Josh Allen places to throw the ball. Now, two of them are tight ends, and you know one of them got hurt this year, and they immediately stopped playing twelve personnel. I get it, but you know Dawson Knox should come back next year. He should be healthy. You've got good wide receivers on the outside. You've got you know the eternal lighted flame of Khalil Shakir. 
like hope it's gonna happen you. EJ. <laughs> i know i know so i don't necessarily think they have to prioritize pass catcher i think secondary depth to really just fight against age and injury mostly injury this secondary has been ravaged and they have so many guys that have stepped up but it's all these guys down the roster who have been asked to shoulder this huge burden and you know the elephant in the room is are we just going to eat the Kyir elam pick and i think they should Kyir elam they look to trade him at the trade deadline nobody bit he does not look like a part of this team going forward in terms of figuring into their plans long term they obviously drafted him up high to fill that role so it's still not filled. <laughs> they didn't go out and do something in free agents. It, like you still have the hole you just missed. It happens. It's the draft. Nobody hits everything. I wasn't a huge Elam fan, but that doesn't matter. I hoped that he would play better, exceed my expectations, and be a fixture in their secondary. It didn't work out that way. So they still need to do that. Plus, they had more injuries again this year, and it has hurt them as a team. Their inability to get stops from the secondary despite having a huge amount of talent it just hasn't all been on the field and it, you know Poyer's not getting any younger Micah Hyde's not getting any younger you know Trey White's missed serious time a couple of years in a row now like you need more options back there and you're really hoping Elam was one he's not like sunk cost get over it pick another one so you thinking Wiggins or or the Bama know, kid or it's got to be it's got to be the one that they like. And again, that does come down to is it one McDermott likes or is McDermott still there? If not, who does the new guy like? So my my pick for them is wildly different and also one that a lot of Bills fans are probably going to hate. They shouldn't hate it, but they probably will because it's way unsexy. <laughs> <laughs> so the first part of it is you trade down a little bit because you don't need to take him at 16. But let's say, you know, Houston's coming up from 24 to get whatever, my receiver sure. or something. You go down to 24. You've seen this kid play live already this year. You saw him at DKR. <laughs> I know who you're talking about. Tavondre Sweat, baby. 360 <laughs> pounds of chaos and despair. Yeah. Jesus, he is tough to handle. Like, it's it's Vita Vea type stuff in terms of a 350 plus pounder that can also rush the passer. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, I, I, don't, I don't understand how he is physically possible. And he's going to go in the first round. Like, I, he's a nose tackle, but like, he's, he's one of those nose tackles who's going to go in the first round. Like, he's insane. But because of the position he plays, he's going to slip a little bit. Like he shouldn't, but he will. Mm -hmm. And he is so Buffalo to me in terms of what they need. Like, again, this defense again this year, again, like they lost in the playoffs in 2022 because of the Daquan Jones injury. They couldn't stop the run. They didn't have anybody that they could put at a one technique who wouldn't get absolutely annihilated. And this year they're still going up 4.7 yards per carry. Like it's still a problem. They still can't stop the run. And obviously the Matt Milano injury has affected that. Obviously, the injuries to the safeties has affected that. But they still need help on the defensive line. They're still getting blown off the ball. Like, that doesn't change that fact. And I think it's going to continue being an issue, whether Milano's out there or not, whether the older safeties they got are out there or not. Like, they still need, you know, somebody besides Daquan Jones that can play the run. So, yeah, give me Devondre Sweat plus picks from Houston. Uh, or whoever, like in the early to mid-20s. And then I'll sleep like a baby because for the first time in years, the Bills would actually have a highly drafted interior defensive lineman who can play a true zero, who can play a one technique and not get absolutely annihilated. It would be the first time since Darius probably that, that they would have a three-down nose tackle that I could rely on. And it's it's been a while since they've had one. And their linebackers would sleep like babies, too. You think Matt Milano wouldn't be better with a guy like Andre Sweat in front of him? Yeah, he would. And it would be a lot of fun. I, it is a need. He is a great player. He's a player that someone you know said to me, hey, I was looking for more of him 
I really wanted to see a jump this year, and boy, has he jumped. I saw the same thing. I saw a bunch of flashes last year. You know that he was the guy that I was most excited to go to Texas and watch live, and he has shown development. He has an amazing frame, but a lot of guys in college have amazing frames and don't match that to their production. He's upped his production this year. He is going to get drafted end of the first round, top of the second, you know, at worst, just because of his position. But he does bring that little bit of extra pass rush that a lot of true noses don't. And, you know, we've seen how dangerous that is with, you know, right down state, Dexter Lawrence, right? Just mm-hmm. wrecking things from the inside. It is a more attractive thing to NFL teams, coaches, and general managers to be able to say, I can put one guy in the middle there and just let him go wreck shop and devote other defensive resources to really – you know, flummoxing the offense in in other ways because that guy is such a problem. He's not just a space holder for a gap or a gap and a half. You know, even a true two gap system. He is he's a wrecker. If I let him go, he really is going to command at least two people. That gives me a numbers advantage. Next team on the list, uh, the other team that I mentioned that would potentially be on the other side of that trade. The Texans. Their native pick is seventeen, but they don't have that pick because they gave it up to Arizona to go up and get Will Anderson, who's been, at least in terms of like efficiency and pass rush win rate and everything like that, he's been one of the best edges in the NFL this year. So I'm good with it. Thanks, Arizona. Love it. Got a starting edge for a long time. Uh, But they still do have the 24th pick from Cleveland that they got in the Deshaun Watson trade. So they are not without a first round pick. It's just slightly later for now. This is a team that all of a sudden doesn't look like it needs that much because their defensive line is exceptional at getting after the quarterback, even though going into the year we had some questions about that. You know, they're still top 10 in pressure rate. You know, their linebackers, their kind of entire platoon of linebackers, you know, you look at Cashman, you look at Toto, like all of them have played well this year. Uh, Their secondary, when they've been healthy, like they've been much more productive this year and, and a lot better at tackling this year as well. Like shout out to Jalen Petre, really turned a corner in terms of being able to tackle. Um, so the defense is fine, mostly. Like they can still use some depth, but they're fine. And then the offense is one of the most productive offenses in the entire NFL because, you know, our Lord and Savior, CJ Stroud. The offensive line, you know, they just lost Titus Howard to injury, but the offensive line has proven that they can sustain through some injuries this year they actually had more depth there than maybe we thought they did uh like even going four deep at some point they were still holding up okay the receivers with nico collins and tank dell and robert woods and noah brown have been good this year schultz has been a rock solid at tight end you still got damon pierce in the backfield and then of course you got cj at quarterback so overall like there's not really a dire need on the roster which when you're looking at a team with a young exciting cheap quarterback and a crap ton of money, like so much money, that they, they can retain all their guys easily. And a first-round pick, that means that they can be aggressive. So, like I mentioned when we were talking about Buffalo, if there's anybody that I think could come up from the mid-20s up into the early teens to go after Adunze if he fell, to go after Keon Coleman, to go after whatever receiver... Because they might lo- they might lose Noah Brown, uh, and of course Robert Woods, you know, at, at his age, like they still need another still need another guy. If there's any team that I think is in the position to do that and be totally fine giving up assets to do that, it is the Houston Texans. And selfishly, I really want to see C.J. Stroud throwing to not just Tank Dell, not just Nico Collins, but also Roma Dunze. Is that likely at all no like that's pie in the sky but best case scenario for the Houston Texans is they realize what they have and they get as aggressive as humanly possible with it and capitalize on this window because the next three years really next four years in Texans history are the most crucial four years in the franchise's history like this is the window this is it this is when you go for it you have one of the best rookie quarterbacks ever Spend the money, spend the picks, go do the damn thing. Like if there's ever a time to be aggressive and not care about the future, it's right now. No greater superpower in the NFL than a young, inexpensive quarterback who is good, and they have that, and then some. 
They've also got John Mechie, you know, in that wide receiver core. You talked about the ability to be aggressive, even if it's not going up aggressive, but you're at 24. One of the things I don't think they have right now on offense that would make them really interesting to me is a Travis Etienne type player. Someone Mm. who is equally dangerous in the passing game and the running game as a sort of, doesn't have to be smaller, but just quicker and more outside back. Singletary for all of his quickness is still more of a between the tackles guy for me. Damian Pierce is definitely between the tackles guy. Get that sort of wild card and you're getting down into the 20s. Again, you have as much depth as you do. You survived on the offensive line. Your defensive line is overproducing. Your secondary, you've invested in, you know, again, last year, and it's paying dividends this year. You have some flexibility to say, hey, let's get us one more really dangerous piece. And I don't really care what that piece is. So if somebody's slipping again because they happen to be a running back, teams don't like spending first-round picks on running backs, like go get a really dangerous equally you know possible or probable running and passing threat i have an idea sure so it's not just about getting a running back that's a receiver it could potentially be getting a receiver that's also a running back yes malachi corley the western uh, kentucky uh, yeah yeah don't know if he's coming out this year but a guy like anaya smith from Texas A&M would fit that description perfectly. Guy that has running back like skills at the wide receiver position, what they used to try and call offensive weapon, much to the chagrin of the NFL who said, no, you can't use OW as a designation because we don't have a salary slot for OW. So you have to, you have to make him one or the other. I don't care what the Texans make him like, again, is he a first round pick? I think that's a little rich, but that type of player that is just a, danger when he gets the ball in his hands from any position can play a little bit in the backfield like that would be an interesting pick to me look at his highlights from last year alone i thought he was going to come out last year and then he decided to go back for another year super explosive athlete has lined up in the backfield has lined up in the slot has lined up outside has lined up everywhere for them has that kind of experience uh you know shorter at 510 but 200 he's compact he's just got that yeah, it's tough for comparison's sake. And again, I don't necessarily think you're going to have to go in the first round. Definitely not to get him. But that type of talent more than that particular player. People always shy away from Debo comps because Debo is just built so different. I mean, he's like 215, 220 pounds. <laughs> he's a right? rock. Like it's it. There's actually very few guys that compare favorably to Debo. Um, but I challenge anybody out there just to get back on the subject of Malachi Corley. I challenge anybody out there to watch Malachi <laughs> Corley highlights and not say, oh my God, that's Debo. Like that's, it's close. If there's anybody in this class who's close, it's it's going to be him. And I would love to see him in Houston. Because again, he's another one of these guys where it's like, all right, it's third and seven. We don't really have any great options here. I guess we'll throw a screen and see what happens. Like your success rate on those goes way up when you're throwing it to Malachi Corley. He's awesome. Uh, All right, Broncos, 18th overall pick. One pick after the Texans' native slot at 17. Uh, They've gone on quite the run over the last month and a half or so. I will say uh, I've I've been charting this defense throughout the entire week, and I'm planning on doing... Uh, an episode on it when I go out to Colorado later this week. Actually, the day that this comes out, I'll be on a flight to Colorado. Uh, And I have mixed feelings on how sustainable this win streak is. Because on one hand, their defense is just playing their ass off. And they're giving, you know, some young guys opportunities to make plays and they're making plays. You know, you got Cooper, uh, you got Benito, you got Baron Browning, you got McMillian in the slot. Uh, like there, there's there's a lot of young guys that have really stepped up and carved out key roles for them and have played brilliantly. But at the same time, since week six, 25% of all drives against this Broncos defense have ended in a turnover. That's not even including turnover on downs. Like it's not sustainable. Like no defense in the history of the NFL has sustained that for a long time. So like they're, they're going to come back down to earth at some point. And if you're looking at just like raw success rates and, and you know, 
punts forced and everything. Like they're actually kind of underperforming in a lot of those type of metrics. It's just they get a bunch of turnovers and they make a bunch of huge plays. So it's like what's like what's real here? And a lot of the turnovers are real. Like, it's not like they're lucky. Like the McMillian pick on Mahomes when he was the hook dropper in cover two was like awesome. Like it's a legitimately great play. He didn't just luck into it. But then you also have the ones where it's like, oh, it bounces off Gabe Davis's hand and into Justin Simmons and you're picking off Josh Allen. Like, It's a little column A, a little column B. So is this sustainable? Is this defensive performance sustainable to go from giving up 36.5 points a game to giving up 16.5 points a game from the first five weeks to the second seven-ish games? Yeah. Probably not. Like Mathematically, it's very hard to sustain that. But do I think the reality is somewhere in the middle? And do I think that that middle reality is still a good football team? Yes. I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs because starting out one and five is a really tough hole to climb out of. But I also think that they're setting themselves up nicely to maybe make a real run in 2024 because Russ looks a lot better this year. Cortland Sutton seems to be back back. Like Cortland's really turned it on in the last month and a half. Javonta looks great. Like, I, even Jerry Judy has made some good plays over the last month and a half. Like, everything seems to be clicking with this team now. So I think they are setting themselves up with some nice momentum going into next year, whether they make the playoffs this year or not. So now, looking at them with the 18th overall pick, it comes down to how do we build on this? How do we patch whatever remaining holes we have so that we can take what we're doing now and take the next step up to compete with, you know, the top teams in the AFC for potentially a high seed next year. Looking at what positions they need and what pick they have, it's it's not super congruent in terms of <laughs> what top talent is going to be available that they need at their current pick. The only position that I could really come up with where there's going to be talent available at the pick that they're likely going to have is safety. And that's about all I can think of, which for me, knowing that you can get really good safeties on day two, means that this is a prime trade down candidate to get a bunch more picks and and kind of shotgun this thing similar to the Rams. Is there anything that you can see that they would take at 18 that makes sense for what they actually need? The only one is wide receiver, and I know a lot of people are going to say, but EJ, didn't Brett just say that Cortland's back and Judy's made some plays? And yeah, they have. Cortland's looked better, way better than he did last year. Judy's looked passable. Again, I think the the hype level for Judy was so incredibly high when he came in. It was going to be tough for him to match that. Mims is amazing. Before we go any farther, like Mims should be getting more opportunities for the Broncos, period. End of story. I hope he is wide receiver two for them by next year. But little Jordan Humphreys even made a bunch of plays, which he hasn't really made on offense anywhere else. Made some special teams plays and other things. But this is a wide receiver core that every year gets racked by injuries. Brandon Johnson, I saw, is just designated to return from IR today. He was on a bit of a roll early in the season, even when the team wasn't playing super well. So they have all these, like, why are you saying wide receiver? It's a bit like the Bills secondary, right? There's players on players in the Bills secondary, but they've just been so hurt and inconsistent that, you know, maybe another target. And again, their offensive line, been pretty good. Tight end, our buddy Adam Troutman has been filling in admirably for Dulcich, who was on IR. Dulcich is going to come back. Uh, they obviously have depth at running back, you know, Thunder and Lightning Plus. So, you know, that or interior D-line or really start looking at, hey, we should be sort of insulating ourselves against guys that are either going to age out or, you know, price out due to contract so that we have some replacement plans in the program, in the pipeline, that can step in fairly smoothly. Safety would be fine there. Feels a little early for safety unless there's somebody you just can't say no to. I'm a big Cam Kitchens guy. That's that's my, like, again, I don't know if I'll take him at 18, but I, but I love me some Cam Kitchens. I really like Cam Kitchens. I think he's great. At 18, I would, I would hesitate, even though I love the player. Understandably. So, Understandably. Yeah, is there... 
anything else that you can do to say, hey, we're going to have big money coming due. I'm not familiar enough with Denver's contract situation to say, hey, what we really need because all these guys are going to walk out the door next year. So at face value, it's like wide receiver, just throw more at it because this has been a tremendous turnaround. Yes, the defense will regress to the mean, normalize a little bit. They have a lot of young players who have been playing much better, which is awesome. Again, that, you know, they can look within their own division and say, look what Kansas City did with that kind of model. We're on that track now. Our young guys are not only getting play that is going to make them better next year, but they're already producing better than the guys that, you know, we were playing in the first half of the year. So that's great for them. It's not a terrible spot, like a mid-round pick and, no glaring needs like we have to have this to compete right now that's not a bad place to be as an organization as far as like free agents that that they really you know might try super hard to keep this year like they don't have like a major major dollar free agent that's coming up um at least urgently in 2024 like Josie Jewell like Green uh, Jackson's center. probably going to retire Cushenberry six Cushenberry's a free agent this year. Oh, you're right. Okay. So Cushenberry, um, like Fabian Moreau, like keep him around as like CB4, little Jordan Humphrey, like you mentioned, like maybe keep him around as like wide receiver four, wide receiver five. Um, but really it's it's the the group after that. Cause next year, 2025. Yeah. Then it comes to ew, it's Garrett Bowles, it's Justin Simmons, it's Patrick yeah. Sertan, it's Judy, yeah. you know, it's it's Javanta. You know, oh, fuck Baron Browning already, John Cooper already. Yeah, like they're all the money that they got. <laughs> they're gonna spend on those guys before yeah. they spend it on the twenty twenty four guys. Because like a lot of their oh god McMillian too. A lot of their best players are free agents in twenty twenty five. So that's probably they're gonna spend ahead of time on them. I I bet. At least they in should. real estate talk. That's the bubble. <laughs> yeah, God, I did not realize it's like all of them. Miners, Jesus, who's been playing really it's well? Just, it's just more Justin, uh, DJ Jones, Tim Patrick again. Well, well, I don't know what's gonna happen with Tim Patrick, but right. boy, that's a lot. I didn't realize they were all in the same year. It's crazy. Uh, all right, last two teams are the worst two teams. They are in purgatory, but their own special version of purgatory. A uh, maybe a worse version of purgatory when it comes to. Carolina and and Chicago we're going to start with Chicago because because we didn't talk about them when talking about the how to fix the worst teams episode and there are a lot of Bears fans that wanted us to address everything that's gone on this year and, and what's happening and you know the outlook going forward before I give you the floor I I just want to put it out there like Again, I'm not I'm not a guy who, who wants people to get fired and lose their jobs and have to move their families and everything like that. But with everything that's gone on this year, I can't imagine that it's going to be the same group calling the shots in 2024. Like it, it there have been so many coaches and GMs fired for a lot less than what's happened with the Bears in the last 2 years. Like a lot less. And considering the position the franchise is in with potentially two top four picks and maybe their pick of head coaching candidates because of that and having all this money to spend. Again, I'm not somebody who takes joy in people getting fired, but good Lord, like how, how could they run this back? I don't, I don't think there's any way they do. Like, even for the Bears, as conservative as they are, like, how do you look at this organization this year and say, yeah, let's do this again? There's a lot of talk that they might. I I don't understand it. I am I am with you, and I will just put this out there. I'm going to start drinking again. <laughs> you should. If they run all of this back, and all of this is, look, I you know, Ryan Poles did the dirty work to – you know, make all this money to clear all the books. Like I can absolutely see it being argued regardless of the decisions you've made. Some of them have been good. Some of them have not, but he should get a chance to pick his guy, spend this money and see the vision forward. I can understand that argument and I'm not going to argue against that. If they 
cleared him out as well, I also would understand the organization's viewpoint, wouldn't necessarily agree with it. As for the coaching staff, if you run Matt Eberflus and this group of coaches back next year, I will probably be a free agent fan for you. <laughs> I don't. You're going you're gonna to do what I would do with the Texans. We're like, yep. I can't emotionally invest in this anymore. I, it's I too much. I don't think I'll be able to because even if they do a lot better, and I mean a lot better, that would be a mid-pack team at best. This is not a worst to first type coaching staff. They have not shown that level of ability or competence. So I'm with you. I don't see how they can say, hey, we're just going to run this back. So I'm going to guess new coaching staff. If that's the case, I imagine that comes with the chance to select a quarterback because you don't always get to pick that high. They're going to want, Poles is going to want to pick his guy. You do if you're the Bears. (laughs) Yeah, more often than not. But strangely enough, they've managed to stay out of the top 10. I imagine new coaching staff, that means new quarterback, wide receiver, center, wide receiver again, if you let Darnell Mooney go, and then safety. Need an Eddie Jackson replacement in the fold. In pretty much that order, right? If you keep Mooney, you can skip the second wide receiver pick and use it for something else. But quarterback, wide receiver, center with a new coaching staff, that's probably my plan going forward. That's as succinct a point as I'm going to put on it. There's lots more to say about this situation. If they run it back, I'm probably going to have to take a break just mentally because I can't see it. Like I don't have that level of vision. I'm not in the building, but from what I've seen from the outside, that would be unconscionable. Like you just you can't justify it. So we'll see what they do, but there's more than a few murmurs that they're – they're set and they could do this and they could run it back. We'll see. Now, I will also say this is not a commentary on Justin Fields' ability. Justin is a good quarterback and he is probably going to go somewhere. He's probably going to get traded somewhere where they'll get a pick for him and he will probably have more success. I do not believe Justin will have success with this group of coaches because I don't think they can see their way clear to it. Like he has more talent than they are using. That is clear. I don't think that's going to change. And that's, yes, there are some things on Justin. Absolutely. People have been saying, well, at some point, some of it's Justin's fault. Sure. Oh, he's made plenty of mistakes. And I think I've been honest about those, but he is also not being used to the level of his ability. Like this is the, the mesh between the situation with Justin and the coaching staff in Chicago just doesn't seem tenable. So one of them is going to leave or both. Again, I if I had to pick anybody coming out of that wash as another organization that I wanted to bet on, I would bet on Justin before most of the others. The best possible thing for Justin Fields, and I I I sincerely want this for Justin because I I do believe in him. I really do. He can't stay with the Bears. No, he has to go somewhere else. And I would agree. We don't know what's going to happen with Arthur Smith, so I'm not I'm not just going to feed him to Atlanta. Like I I I, I refuse to do that. So for Justin's sake, like what's best for him is to look around at the league and to find a team with a very good offensive coach, a proven developer of talent, developer of quarterbacks. Ooh. You and I might be thinking of the same one. We might. Go for it. And it's a team that is going to need a new quarterback fairly mm. soon. Oh, we're and not who might, <laughs> who, who definitely doesn't want to send a first round pick for it. Mm. And I think could send a day two pick for it. And that to me is the LA Rams. Justin Fields as the heir apparent to Matthew Stafford, who might come back for another year, maybe, and being developed by Sean McVay with, you know, Puka Nakua to grow with, see if they add more receivers again, because Cooper Cup's getting up there too. Um, and, and And you just let Justin reset. You give Justin an opportunity to have a Geno Smithening, so to speak. But like more, more so because he's more talented than Gino. 
But like that's that's what I sincerely want for him is to go to that environment with a proven coach, a proven developer of talent, a proven system. Uh, you know, uh, with an owner that's willing to spend to surround him with the talent it needs to be surrounded by. Like that's like say what you want about Stan Kroenke. Like he will open the checkbook. Like he absolutely will open the checkbook. And I think it's only fair to Justin, considering what the Bears organization has saddled him with, to mm-hmm. give him an opportunity with a competently run organization. And that's the LA Rams. Mine's different, and I don't think it'll happen. I think the chances of it happening are very low because the organization wouldn't send as high a pick as it will probably bid up to, but I could see Justin being traded for third. And I know people are going to hue and cry like trade values are typically less than you think they are. Trey Lance got a four. <laughs> like, I understand. Come on now. <laughs> I understand. So again, I don't think it's going to happen period just because of probably the, the amount of investment, but in terms of offensive developer fits with his skill set, the pieces are already in place. Send him to Indianapolis to back up AR. Ooh. You got Shane Steichen. You got Pierce and Josh Downs running deep. The deep ball is truly his strength from the passing game. My my one problem with it is he wouldn't play. That would be okay. He probably will. Like, AR's been beat up. He played for one month this year, and he had multiple injuries. So who better than to say, in terms of let's not change the offense very much, roll Justin in there. Like so, bombs away, that would be so fun. Kind of like a, I mean, a totally different quarterbacks and different levels of talent. But when they sent Mitch to Buffalo, basically, of like you know, go go learn from Dable and sit behind Josh and fix yourself, and then get another shot if, somewhere else. If there's nobody willing to start him, and I'm not sure that there will be again because we don't know what's happening with Blank and the Falcons, which is typically where people are just shoehorning Justin in. He's from Georgia. I understand it. He would be fun in that offense, but I have no <laughs> no certainty about where the Falcons are going to go. So if there's nobody willing to start him, because even in the Rams, you're not talking about him starting. You're talking about him being an heir apparent, right? Backing people up. And if that's the case, like send that guy to Indianapolis because he can – learn from Shane Steichen, come in, throw some bombs to Pierce and Josh Downs, get people excited, manufacture yards with the quarterback run game behind that offensive line. Like that would be, that would be awesome. Last team, Carolina Panthers. They're last in a lot of ways. (laughs) (laughs) They're last in many, many statistics this year. Uh, They, their own version of purgatory is really closer to hell than, than anything else. Because it's bad. It is bad. You got David Tepper, very impulsive, intrusive, dare I say, owner, who between his NFL team and his MLS team has fired four head coaches in the last like two years. Uh, Carolina Panthers in the David Tepper era have had six total head coaches in six years between the three head coaches and then the three interims. He has a very short leash, he's very impulsive. Apparently, even though he denied it, sort of, kind of, in that press conference where he's like, everybody believed in Bryce. Everybody, everybody came to a consensus. It was Bryce. It's like, well, I don't know about that because we were hearing... <laughs> Guy with the money before, gets to say that. We were hearing months before the draft. It was like, oh, yeah, Stroud, done deal. Like, we heard it at the Super Bowl. Like, Stroud, Carolina, done deal. Like, before they even traded up, we heard about the trade. It's like, that's who they're going to get. That's their guy. And then, like, what, three weeks before the draft, you know, getting all these messages of like, hold on, <laughs> things things are different now, okay? Might not happen. <laughs> and it's like, hmm, gee, wonder why that is. So, again, Tepper did Tepper things. And, you know, was Frank Reich having a great year? No. Like, there were a lot of things that Frank Reich did that were not good. Like, a, a screen on fourth and six. Come on, what are we doing here? And a lot of the decisions that were made, it's like, okay, let's bring in Adam Thielen to be our most reliable target, and he runs like a 4.75 at this point. Like, he catches everything, but he has to because there's no separation. Like, none of the receiving court can separate. Uh, you know, they can't run the ball. Pass protection's terrible. Bryce has gotten shelled. Bryce hasn't looked good because he's gotten shelled. They have no first-round pick. They have no DJ Moore. 
They have a second round pick, but like there's there's just not a whole lot there. And so it's it's worse than purgatory. It really is. It's borderline hell. And I I don't really know how long it's going to take them to dig out of this because who are they even going to get to replace Frank Reich at this point? Like who are who who's <laughs> going to take likes that money. job? Yeah, it has to be. Likes, it has yeah. to be right because any young coach knows that like you can get one chance in the NFL and you can get fired and you can get a second job. Like you you can get maximum of like two chances as a young coach. Frank Reich got two chances, right? But why would you potentially waste your first and therefore most valuable chance on an owner that might fire you in 18 months or less? Fire you up to 11 games. He got less games than Urban Meyer did. Okay. Yep. So why would Ben Johnson, his first and most valuable coach, head coaching opportunity, why would he went, uh, spend it on the Panthers? Why would Kellen Moore? Why would Mike McDonald? Like, why would they go there? The only coaches they're going to get to come in and replace Frank Reich are the ones that are on their last chance already. You know? Or completely borderline and wouldn't get it otherwise. Who will take the money with the risk because it's both and say, because you know this as well as I do, coaches are great believers in salvaging all situations. I can fix them. I you know? can make it better. And he will find somebody. There are only 32 of these jobs. Somebody will bite. And yes, he will have to pay them. Absolutely, because people are going to come in knowing that that axe is held over their head. But somebody will take this job, and it is possible. They have a bunch of pieces on defense, turn it around. The offense looks rough right now. There are a few little bright spots in there, but they are few and far between on that side of the ball. You are with Bryce for the next year or two for sure. Like There is no going away from that. You don't have the draft capital to change that. Short of a, you know, sort of Kirk Cousins in the fourth round miracle type deal, and, you know, that could happen if Bryce gets hurt and then, you know, the Bailey Zappies of the world step up and, you know, go on a run. I get it. But in terms of like, <laughs> the way things normally work, you're going to be dealing with Bryce Young. And that might not be a bad thing if you get him some receivers who can separate, get him a little protection so he's not, um, you know, as skittish as he's been. And that's really where it starts. They thought they'd invested a bunch in this offensive line and it hasn't panned out. And like a bunch of other teams on this list, hey man, you took a swing. It's cool. But don't let sunk costs continue to roll into next year and hurt your football team. If you can't protect up front, no offense is going to work. I don't care who your quarterback is. I don't care who your coach is. Like, like you said, can't pass, can't run. Like you got to get some offensive line. So that's probably where it starts for me. And sure, trade down. It'd be nice. There was a lot of talk about, oh, the efficiency of the model. And, you know, Tepper's really interested in, you know, game theory. And I was like, ooh, fascinating. Like, let's trade down a bunch of times and pick up picks and see how it works. It only works if you let people develop and you don't fire them after like an absolute half a hitch. So, it's a weird spot right now, but I would start with the offensive line and say, hey, we got to get there. I know that faster progress is probably going to be demanded. I, I There's no silver bullet for me. It's not going to happen that quickly. One of the things that really just shocks me the most about this team is how bad their offensive line is considering who they have on it. Because on paper... Yep. Like going into this year on paper, we're like, eh, hey, okay. Like they could, they have lots of work with. Like Ike Aquano had a great rookie year. Like, you know, their interior trio, you know, played well a year ago. We're like, okay, rock and roll. Like, let's go. This is a, this is a decent offensive line. And they've been the worst, <laughs> at least yeah. arguably the worst. Like it's them or the Giants or the Titans, you know, in terms of who's the, who's the worst offensive line in the NFL. And a lot of that comes down to James Campen, who's the offensive line coach. Uh, you know, prior to his stop at Carolina, he was in Houston, and they were not very good. Prior to that, he was with the Chargers in Justin Herbert's rookie year, where they were famously not very good. <laughs> and then prior to that, you know, he was uh, he was an offensive line coach uh, in Cleveland under the past regime, like pre Stefanski, where they were not very good. So there's a pattern there, and I wouldn't be surprised if they address that in the off season. And 
I think the bones are there for them to be a decent offensive line. Like, Iki Aquanu didn't just suddenly <laughs> become untalented. They can be better, let's be honest. Like, we like Chandler. He had good tape. He played well next to Icky. We thought that that relationship would go a long ways. Some of this is coaching and scheme. Not all of it, but they are better than they've shown. They are bouncing off the floor of offensive line rankings, and they're not that bad. Like, they are better than that. Chandler Zavala gave up, like, and he was he's been in the ACC playing against, like, legitimately good defensive linemen, and he gave up a pressure rate of like 1.2% or something like that. Like not even, it was lower than that. Like he didn't just suddenly become a bad football player. Like to give up an average of like eight pressures a game. Like what the hell? Like there has to be something else going on here. Like Iki Aquanu didn't suddenly become untalented. I think it really does come down to coaching. And again, I don't take pleasure in saying like somebody should be fired, but well, Come on, find, like something's got to be done Find another here. job, maybe. Like, we don't <laughs> want you to be fired, but we don't want you to have this job. You know, it's like the bar. It's closing, you know. I mean, can't, four teams. Can't four stay teams here. in five years. Four teams in I, five years for James Campen. Like, it's... I, I would go knocking on like Bill Callahan's door and say, Bill, who's your <laughs> good, favorite? Good, good luck finding no, a number high enough. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to get Bill, but I'm going to say, Bill, who's your favorite young offensive line coach? Like, yeah. who do you think is absolutely ready right now? Because I've got some, you know, I've got a chance where they're going to be able to prove it. I've got some good pieces that I think are better than they've showed. He can polish them up a little bit and see a large increase pretty quickly without a whole lot more investment. Now, they do need to invest some, but it's not as bad as it looks. And I do, I'm with you. I think the difference is in the coaching. We'll see what they do. Um, we'll see if they if they make that tree for, or trade for T Higgins, uh, you know, 33rd overall. They either like if they're desperate, where it's like we need to get a proven commodity right now. The proven commodity is T Higgins because you never really know with with rookies, even in a sure. rookie class as good as this one. We think as good as this one. You never really know. Like T nope. at least, you know, is good. But either way, that 33rd pick is probably going to be spent on a receiver one way or another. It kind of <laughs> probably to should be. be, too. Yeah. And then after that, we'll see. You know, there's going to be a lot of changes in Carolina. There's already been a lot of changes in Carolina, but there's going to be even more changes in Carolina. Uh, and I I really do wish them all the best because this is a very unenviable position, and I feel for Panthers fans everywhere that, you know, came into this season with a lot of hope and a lot of hype. You know, we got Bryce Young. Like we got Mingo. Like, th- there was a lot of reasons to be excited. We got, got the highest-paid coaching staff in the NFL. We got a Giro Rivero. You know, he's going to turn up this defense. And Averro has actually done a really nice job with the defense. Like, there were so many reasons to be excited. Like, full disclosure, I, I picked them to win the division. Like, there's a lot of reasons to be excited about Carolina. And they've just been miserable. So, I feel for Panthers fans, it's not going to be an easy fix. It's not going to be a quick fix. And, uh, yeah, I really don't know what they're going to do. Like, this is one of the few where I just kind of throw my hands up and say, I don't know. <laughs> Good <laughs> stuff. Enough. Good luck. Glad it's not me. Yeah, basically. And like I was there as a Texans fan a few years ago where I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, yeah, bring on the David Cully era, you know, with Davis Mills as your starting sure. quarter. Like, but it does it does go to show. That's an excellent example of, hey, you can be in the depths of we're in a terrible spot and we don't know what we should do. And, you know, 24 months later, sun can be a whole lot brighter. You got to make the right choices. You got to make the right hires for sure. But in the NFL, it is it is not the old dynasty era where it's going to take six, seven years for it to turn around. If you make good choices, you can turn it around in two, two and a half years. Hell, even Panthers fans have experience with that. Like I remember, they do not not too long ago. I mean, kind of a long time ago, but not to date myself. But you know, it was oh, we're in the Jimmy Clausen era. <laughs> And 12 months oh, later, it's like, oh, we're in the Cam man. Newton era now. Okay. <laughs> like, yeah. Things so, are different. Things are different. Yeah. Things are different. Uh, all right. That'll do it for today's show. A little bit of a long one. Went over a lot of mid-pack teams and some slightly, not even slightly, very much below mid-pack teams. <laughs> uh, I think we have now talked about all 32 teams yes. over the last four episodes. So we will not accept any more complaints about not talking about your team. <laughs> We could go back to talking about the playoff races uh, going into to next week. I think bye weeks are done 
as of the end of week 13. I believe they are. So from here on out, uh, everybody's playing every single week, I think. You know, we're down to the last five weeks of the playoff race. The AFC is super tight. The NFC is suddenly super tight. We have a lot to go over. We will not have a, uh, a Monday show next week because, again, I'll be in Colorado working on that Broncos episode. But we still will have our TNF live stream, and uh, we still are going to have our Friday show. So make sure to come back next week for that. We want to thank all of our patrons in the executive producer tier, Marat, Consti, Andrew, Liam, Connor, and Mike L. We appreciate all of you very much. Uh, also, by the way, EJ and I are wearing, for the first time Woot. on the show, our new bootleg merch that we got uh, through our deal with Homage. They are now distributing bootleg merch. So if you're interested in getting hoodies or shirts or anything of that nature to represent bootleg and to support bootleg, you can find that either on the QR code on the screen or on the link in the description. <laughs> EJ is showing off the hood. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he actually gets a lot more use out of that than I do because he lives in Seattle. And <laughs> we, don't, we don't even know what rain is down here. Freaking 34 degrees outside right now. It is. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to make you it feel not, like shit. Not 34 degrees there. I'm so it's 7, 12 p.m. Oh. in L.A. And it's uh, oh a frigid 63 degrees. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I did just not buy a bunch of powder it. pants, though, because I'm about to go into the Rockies <laughs> in <laughs> December. So I'm not going to be warm for long. But anyway, uh, thank you all for listening. We'll see you guys next week. I don't think I have anything else. You good, EJ? No. No. Travel safely, and uh, we'll catch up with everybody next week. See you then.